this is kind of my this is my this is my work. This is kind of where I am at, and it's a quick series of snapshots. And I've limited it to 15. Okay. Well, number one is in terms of um, understanding environment as creation, and I'm not. And some of these will be just quickly. I'll just quickly touch on because we don't have time, and also because other people have already touched on them. That uh, I think in this kind of in this perspective, uh, we understand <coughs> creation as something which has been created and which in itself is a blessing. And the Hebrew word for blessing is berakah, which is not just the notion of blessing, and certainly not in the sense of magic, but in acknowledging the goodness. So when we bless bread and wine, when we bless water, when we bless food, when we're gathered with our families, you know, whether it's rituals of family, of friendship, explicitly religious or spiritual rituals, they're acknowledging the goodness, the sacredness, because they are a gift as well. So they're not only blessed and good, but they also are a gift that points to the giver. Secondly, all creation belongs to God. And the idea, I think, of property, which is a relatively recent invention of the last few hundred words, years, the last few centuries, I have questions about how much in harmony that is with a deep biblical perspective of the land. And the perspective of the land that we see implicitly in the New Testament, explicitly very much so in the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, is very much that the land belongs to God and that property, if we can use that term, is something that is a tenancy. It's a sojournership, and the, certainly Levitical law talks very clearly about you do not own this land, you are sojourners here, invoking the Exodus motif. And I think this has profound implications. We have no clue about how deep this is as far as our whole economic system. And I think we need to do redo a whole economics that comes from, this, uh, I think, a, a, a spiritual foundation. And you could tell that would be a whole course in itself. Number three. There are three parties in the covenant. Now, you may remember in the Hebrew Bible, there are three covenants. There's certainly the Moses covenant. There's uh, a covenant that comes later that's really embodied in Jeremiah. That's a kind of post-exilic covenant. But the earliest covenant is essentially between, is, is embedded in Genesis 9, in the, in the Noah story. And that covenant, as I've said on other occasions, but I think it's so fundamental to a biblically centered ethos, is that we have for 2,000 years done an exegesis on that, or interpretation of that passage, understanding there are two parties in the covenant, human beings and God. I would like to submit to you, we've missed a key element, which is strung throughout the entire Hebrew, as well as the Christian New Testament, the Hebrew Bible, Christian New Testament, which is that Adama, the earth communities, all the ecological communities, are the third party in the covenant. You see it explicitly in the promise of God with the rainbow and all of that, that God makes a covenant with human beings and with all living things. We have behaved as if there are only two parties in the covenant. You see it implicitly in the second creation story where creation, the Hebrew language, is almost like the water bubbling up and the earth starting to form. And the imagery that recent biblical scholarship has pointed to is that that's almost a sense that the pointing to this, this other notion that the earth communities are the third party in the covenant. When Cain kills Abel, the same thing. The blood rises, drips into the earth, and the earth, with saturated with the blood, with that injustice, cries out for justice. And again, there's this imagery, if you think about it, of is, in a certain sense, 
the Earth communities a third party of the covenant. It even stretches all the way to the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation 12, when the woman who is God's servant is being pursued by the embodiment of evil, the dragon, it's the earth that opens up and hides the woman from the forces of evil. And in fact, we could do an ecological rereading of the book of Revelation because it's interesting to see the ecological features that are there, as well as a profound critique of our present economy. And this is an interesting notion as well because in Jewish law, relationships and covenant relationships were always involving witnesses. So if Don and I are having some kind of making agreement, we'd bring in joy as a witness. And so the idea of a third party witness is embedded in this Jewish notion of law and relationship. And I think that's because it's actually embedded in the very biochemical constitution of the universe that we are also in a third party relationship with God and with the earth community. We come out of that community. Which leads to the um, fourth point, which is that I think the biblical tradition certainly makes very clear of the strong continuity between the human, Adam, Adam and the earth community, Adama. We see this especially in all the Psalms. And in Ecclesiastes, there's clear references that we return to the earth like the beasts return to the earth. We share the same breath. There's a sense of emphasizing the continuity that we have with the earth. Number five, I think a biblically grounded spirituality posits something which is almost unintelligible to us as modern human beings, which is that the earth is not an inert object or set of resources, but has an intrinsic moral purpose and an intrinsic goodness because it was created by God. And that it is meant to flourish. That's its inner purpose, its inner telos, which if allowed to be itself, that's what it provides. And that if we live in harmony that's with it, that's what it will provide for us. This means that all of the basic elements of ecological science, the fact that there are limits, the importance of diversity, the fact that things tend towards building community and creating new life, all of those elements that we see in environmental science are in fact quite in harmony with this very ancient view that we see in the Hebrew scriptures, which are shared by, as far as I know, every spiritual wisdom and religious tradition of recognizing the goodness and the sacredness of the earth. And it's peculiar to us as moderns, whether we're religious or not, that we think that if we, as Michael Northcott says in his book on ethics, that we think we could build our houses on the sides of volcanoes or we can build them on floodplains, then we're surprised when our houses are flooded or inundated. And then we could say that that's mother nature but in fact, it's based on, I think, a modern scientific point of view, or one kind of science, I wouldn't say all science, which is that, that's, that it's devoid of any moral purpose. Sorry, disasters are usually referred to as acts of God. Acts of God. That's right. 